welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 152 with Bradford Libson, DP of Prom Dates. Enjoy. Ostensibly, it's all about cinematography, but sometimes not you so veer off course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially, I'm I'm all over the place. Um, actually, I did. <laughs> it's been a it's been an ongoing theme on accident, but I had uh, Larry Fong on ostensibly to talk about magic because he and I are both magicians. And then Marcus Forer was on, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I was a magician too." And then I just read an interview with you that you were also a magician when you were younger. Okay. And still am. I, I actually am a Magic Castle member. Oh, really? Yeah. Hell yeah. I Are you a this. Magic Castle member? No, but uh, I have shot for a bunch of magicians there. So I have a uh, an open invite, which I abuse quite often. But um, yeah, a, bunch, uh, a lot of the magicians have been like, oh, you should just like join. And for the longest time, uh, I was always talking like I didn't really have like a routine. Like I didn't have a character to build around the tricks that I do know. And right. Pretty, pretty much everyone was like, yeah, that doesn't really matter for the tryout. Like, do the tryout and then figure that part out later. Yeah. You know, I think you probably could. I, I think that as long as you have a routine, you know, what? So th- I know that throughout time, the Magic Kessel changes their requirements, their auditioning mm-hmm. requirements. So, what at the time when I was joining, it was just come in and, and perform three tricks. Oh. But because because I performed way earlier in my life and 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 did performances uh, with routines, I was like, I had this doesn't feel right to come in and do trick one, trick two, trick three. So I I like cobbled together what I was gonna do mm-hmm. and to be ready for the audition. And and really quite like this is what's really funny. Um so I signed up I I took refresher classes with Mark Wilson, who was kind of one of my childhood heroes, mm. if you can believe it. So like to sit with him in a classroom and chat with him and hear his stories, well, you know, with him on t- the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, like it was just, it was awesome. But anyway, I kind of was brushing up on magic and then he sponsored me and um, I signed up and they said, well, it's about a six month waiting period for the audition. And so I was like, okay, no problem. And I kind of had in my head, I think I know what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And I, they like casually just said, and you can also sign, uh, you can just sign up. Like if somebody cancels, we can call you. Mm. And so I was like, okay, yeah, put me on that list. Well, I was getting ready to go down to New Orleans to be the rotating DP on Astronaut Wives Club. Mm. It's like three or four days before I was leaving, the Magic Castle calls me. It was like Monday and they're like, hey, come on down tonight. We have an opening. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not really prepared. But I I basically just threw all my stuff in my in my childhood magic case right. and, and kind of was like, okay, I'm going to wing it. Yeah. And But I mean, I knew the three tricks that I wanted to do and I knew how I could kind of tie it all together. So that wasn't really the problem, but I just really hadn't practiced it much. And so my whole presentation was that I, my, in, in my performance was that, Hey, my mom called me to tell me she was cleaning out the closet and she found this old magic case and here it is. And she, you know, like, do you want it? You know, come over and get it. And I figured you'd want it. And so I set it down on the table and I click open the the, the little latches and I open it up and I go, now you all know what it's like when you open something from your childhood and all these memories come rushing in. So that was my routine. That's right? a great setup. Yeah. And I'm like pulling out, I put a bunch of props in there from, from my childhood, real stuff from my childhood magic days. And one of the things I put in there was this ridiculous, it was like this cheap little plastic frame with a newspaper cut out of Harry Blackstone Jr. and his wife coming to Denver to perform. And I had gotten their autographs. And so I had their autographs in there, him and Gabe Blackstone in this thing. And I, t- and I, and I'm like, Oh, like, here's one of my favorites. And I pull it out and I'm showing it to him and all, all the whole auditioning committee is like this. <laughs> and, and, I, and I walk around the table to be like right in front of them. And I go, guys, I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is real. And this, 
older woman in the front row grabs my hand and pulls it, pulls the picture to her. And she says, I know that's real because that's my autograph. It was Gabe Blackstone. That's incredible. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was nervous after that because. Right. Yeah. She fucked up your whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that that's that's my my audition to the Magic Castle. That's pretty good. Yeah, I've had to stop uh, just doing table shuffles under the mic because <laughs> I'll go back and review like the audio. I'm like, you can just hear. Like, yeah. you know. so card magic. We'll have to exchange information uh, and meet sometime. Card magic. I I struggle. If I used to be okay with it, I mm. I've worked coins for such that I, I'm like really adept with coins but i like kind of all over the place with cards yeah well yeah we'll definitely have to trade i uh, ma- uh coin magic is one of those because like carrying a deck of cards on you is kind of can be a little uh antiquated depending on the group you're with you know if you're at a bar or whatever like, hey! Hey! <laughs> but like you know even a big like i have a pretty cool um a few of them actually like these liberty head dollars mm-hmm. and um those uh you know, having one, yeah, this is a lucky coin and then going for it. I feel like that's more acceptable, you know, to people. It is, it. but even coins are like, you know, like I'll pull out a coin for younger people and they'll be like, yeah, what's that? <laughs> yeah. Where did you get your liberties? Because I have been trying to get some liberties for a new routine. Um, eBay. Uh, but I have, let's see here. They're not, it feels weird because they come in like, you know, plastic case but i got uh two of these and i got one more that i actually carry around with me they're all from uh 22 and 23 um but it's just one of the prettier coin like the the liberty head i think we just need to bring that back with the spiky crown. yes do you know danny goldsmith or no up yeah i i bought uh last winter this is so stupid so last winter i was in france running a ski trip for um what was it like Yale business club and Harvard business club. And, uh, so I'm in France and I'm, I'm talking about being a magician and I didn't have any cards with me. So I go on Danny's website and I download a few of his tricks and I'm like sitting there practicing them and I couldn't get any, cause he is one of the cleanest coin magicians I've ever seen in my life. Like he actually is doing magic <laughs> and, yeah. uh, yeah, couldn't get him down in time to enter, uh, entertain anyone. Yeah, there his routines are really um his slights are are really involved. So le- like just recently maybe 3 4 months ago I downloaded I paid for one of his routines I mm. cuz I kept kept popping up on my feed and I was like how the hell is he doing this? And so I I bought it and I started trying it and and he recommends the liberties and I have like a, a bunch of the 50 cent pieces, you know, mm. the the, I have both the um what are they the walking li- the the um what are they the um oh my gosh the older coins uh it's not a liberty it's a I'll have what, to remember the like big ones the, it's it's a fifty cent piece but it's not oh. I have both the the Kennedy halves but there's then another one that is really nice the I want to say walking liberty does that make sense I am. Uh, I okay. just got those because I really liked the, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, it's the coin that Two-Face has mm-hmm. in uh, the Tim Burton Batmans. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted one. And then I bought three. <laughs> I'll, I'll, so I reached out to, uh, do you know Roy Cooper, who Roy Cooper is? Sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah he he's the, he he's in Vegas and he manufactures all like the shells. Got it. And all of those things. And so I had reached out to him to ask if he had, I want like a matching set of mm-hmm. liberty. And then I, I hadn't really followed through with him. So I don't know whatever came of it. Yeah. Anyway, I think, I think I picked him up for like 30 bucks a pop. They weren't like too grand. I got him like five, six years ago, but uh, they weren't terribly expensive. But it does feel weird. Like I said, it does feel weird getting them like they're in like a plastic shell, you know, they're all shiny. And then you're like, it, get out of there. I'm going to use this. <laughs> Right. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Well, Roy Cooper has a routine um, on his site that I don't know if you ever mess with, um, you know, any any gimmicks, but. Uh, I mean, I used scotch and soda for a decade. That okay. was just easy to carry on me all the time. Right. I spent mine once, unfortunately. Oh, 
<laughs> Oops. I always, I always, I always have, flick them just because, you know, you can hear the dead one. So yeah. I'd always be like, all right, so don't, not that one. I, I was not smart enough to do that. I'm trying to think what the name of his route, what this routine is. I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, my magic's just right there. Oh, yeah. I'll get it. I'll get in a little bit. Sure. I, I can, you know, but it's this, it's an amazing routine where it's basically a matrix that, that you just use your hands. Mm -hmm. make the Instead of putting cards, cards over them. Yep. And it's. Yeah. It's awesome. It's one of my favorites. So um, I highly, if you like coin magic, I look into that. It's really fun. People just go, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Because the beauty is you get to rate, there's moments where you can raise both hands when you're doing it. And they, people are going to think that you're like, you have, you're covering something up, but then you raise your hands and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's fine. And then you keep doing it and it's like, oh my God, how is he doing this? Yeah. Did you it's see really fun. I'll definitely have to. I took a note here because I I've always wanted to get more into coin magic because it just feels more carryable, you know. Um, uh, but also um, that reminds me, I was at. Nope, that thought's gone. Oh, did you see? Uh, it was like two years ago. Markobi's like uh, was it Fizdom winning card uh, performance? I didn't know. It's look it up it's fantastic because he just plays like a schlub so he's like it's incredibly messy and, and great but there's because he's doing it for like you know all magicians he has a few fake out when you're talking about being able to like lift your hands and showing it he has one where he it's one of the best lights i've ever seen where it's like he goes like that and then hold you know as a joke is like holding his chin and is like pick a card and they pick it and he goes do you want to switch and they've already got it in their hands and everyone's just like come on give me a break like right right that's awesome i'll have to look it up yeah, his name's Mark Kobe. He's a French dude. Do you um, go to Do you go to Magic Live or any of the? No, of pretty much just the castle. There's a um, uh, theater over here in Santa Monica that I'll pop into every once in a while. But um, well, I mean, like the big convention, like Magic. Oh Live. no, no, I've never been. I, yeah, I haven't. I might be going this August if I can. Oh, if, where's that at? Vegas? It's in Vegas. It's yeah. huge. To write that down. You can go that. I, I went to my first magic convention um, a few months ago. It must have been January in San Diego for it's it's the West Coast. They call it the, the IBM such and such West mm -hmm. Coast or Western half of the United States. And it was rather interesting. Uh, it was an eye opening experience for me because I didn't expect like it was mostly retired mm -hmm. people. Yeah. That that is one thing that's kind of so. I actually a uh, few. I don't know if you were there, but like two weeks ago, uh, when Richard Turner was at the castle, I've seen him up quite a few times. Yeah, yeah I didn't that was see him last time, but he's impeccable. Yeah, that was because uh, I, you know, my uh, my sister goes with me all the time, and uh, it was funny because you know she's seen enough magic to to kind of know like at least where things are headed, not how it's done, but kind of you know sometimes you'll see repetitions, and I. She just at when she left. I was like, "How the fuck? Like, how does he know where anything is?" How I'm like, he practices for twelve hours a day for sixty years. Like, that's just yeah. what that looks like, right? That's exactly right, and that's my big problem is uh, Kenny. I I just don't practice. <laughs> I mean, same. And and I, I you know, and I go through these weird spurts. Like, I'll I'll practice really heavily, and then and then other things come up. You know, work stuff and whatever, and then it's like. I just, I should really just, even if it's a half hour a day, but I just like put it aside and then I have to kind of, it's not starting over. Some of it's like riding a bike. Yeah. I, I learned the, um, hanging coins. That's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that routine. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I learned that a while back and I pretty much am to the point now where when I do it, I could almost, I could, I could maybe just practice a little bit, but it's, it, you get that muscle memory going enough then it's like okay i i kind of have it yeah that anyway is, that is the one nice thing about card magic is like you can be watching a tv show and kind of just at least yeah. practice you know practicing palm shifts or you know air shuffles whatever the hell you know it's a, it's a very therapeutic it's the original fidget spinner right and it's the same thing with coins yeah you know you can, you can do the same thing with coins so I, I should be doing it more with cards now though it's a fun i've got over here, this whole upper section is, I think it's like 60 decks. So you can have some of my, if you need any new ones. 
Um, I kind of have the same thing. I have a whole, I have like a little practice area with cards and, uh, you know, all the junk throughout the years. If I would be able to I, I, let's see, I don't know if I can bring it over my, some of my old magic. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That's pretty good. Yeah. That's, well, I don't know why I leaned like this. That's stupid. Like, let me get around the iPad. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's the end of the podcast. No. <laughs> um, you know, when I was, when I was, uh, when I looked that up, I saw something that didn't occur to me at the time. Cause I remembered and then forgot. Cause it's been a while. Um, and it's r- roughly more gear talk, but you shot Wilfred on DSLRs mm-hmm. and it doesn't look like that. It looks you know, like any, I mean, obviously at the time, the shallow depth of, you know, your 5D D800 look was unique. Um, but nowadays, you know, it, it would be kind of commonplace to shoot something on a mirrorless or a DSLR roughly. Same thing on like house. I know you worked on house. They did that one famous episode on the 5D. Um, right. And I was wondering what for like newer people listening, what were the challenges of shooting a show on like a D800? versus now you know like what what upgrades have made those irrelevant now you know what unique challenges were on that show okay so it's funny that you say this because last night i was at a dinner uh with auto nimitz and and Mm. many other dps and and we we were talking about this Mm. about just this and so the 5d and the d800 back then i think what the two biggest challenges they were i believe i think the the 5D was 8-bit, correct me if I'm wrong. Sounds right. And, Unless and, you had Magic Lantern. Yeah. And um, I think the other part was the dynamic range wasn't that great. Mm. So it was it was it was challenging on that show in particular because we shot both directions at the same time. We would we basically had three cameras going. So I'd shoot um we'd shoot a master and overs at the same time. So if you're at the front door on season one, we were on five D's. And when we were at the front door of, um, uh, what, what was the main character's name? Uh, uh not Elijah Wood. Wood. <laughs> well, yeah, Elijah. Wood, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't remember the character's name. Uh, but anyway, we'd be at the front door and one camera would be shooting out. The other camera would be shooting in. So the camera shooting in, I, I had to do the opposite of whatever I was doing shooting out. Like I would have a 4K Chimera, you know, to shoot towards the outside of right. whoever we were shooting and flagging that all off the actor in the doorway. And, you know, then shooting into the house, I had to kind of like almost take away light and take away light from out. You know what I mean? It was yeah, kind of- yeah. Bizarre kind of like uh, you had way. to design the gradient between outside and inside. Yeah, yeah. And then season two, we we I believe we went on to stage, and then in season three, so it kind of made parts of that easier. Although we'd always shoot the the out, you know, obviously on location. So right, uh, but it took away some of some of that issue. But I think it was just the eight bit aspect and the dynamic range were the two biggest parts of of where that was challenging mm. to make lighting work and like okay how can i make it look like there's a lot of latitude when there really isn't and you know how can i stretch it as much as i can and 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 hold the hold the highlights and, and hold the blacks and all of that that just kind of was i think its biggest challenge at the time and then i'd say the second big the next biggest challenge was just and it got kind of, it got better through time through trial and error, but it was still always kind of hard. Is like you know they're DSLRs and they're not, they're not production cameras. They'd overheat, and you know map box would fall off in the middle of a shot, and you know kind of like oh, or the the um, the focus motor would disengage and you <laughs> just know, slide right you know, off. Yeah, and it's yeah. just I just remember stuff like that was kind of because um, there weren't hard. cages for these cameras back then. No. It was it was the very beginning of that, so it was kind of like okay, um, you know how do how do we do this? So it it was it was a learning process for sure, and uh, and then over time, you know, it just kind of kind of worked out. And then I left, I think, season three or something, mm. and uh, went on to do other things. Yeah, because the I, when I think about because that wasn't terribly long ago, but you know, for 
younger people getting into this, that, that might as well have been the stone age, you know, <laughs> but I remember in college, you know, the, the five D coming out college for me, the five D coming out, uh, and kicking the, uh, DVX 100 to the curb. Um, but my film school, we all had to fight over the one, otherwise you're shooting on TV. But yeah, I think it had like what, eight stops of dynamic range or something like that. Yep. yep that was about it. And you know, the, the, the crazy thing is I, I won an ASC award on that. Nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> what was it? Was, was the reasoning just because it, it was allowed, allowing you to really selectively choose your depth of field? Cause I know like the show is ostensibly in, uh, Elijah's character's head the whole time, but like, were yeah. there any other, um, that was really, the, no. no, I think, I think it was like, it allowed, I, and I didn't do the pilot. So, right. you know, and so this choice was made by the show creators and showrunner and, and everybody, they, they made the choice because they liked that look. And I think it was a good choice. Mm, I think yeah. it was the right choice for that show. So it worked. And now you could turn around and go out and, and have, you know, you could do that on a, on almost any camera. Now you could go full frame and get that same, that same vibe. Yeah. What the, uh, what was the D 800 offering you that the five D didn't? Cause nowadays, especially Nikon, you know, their, their Z series is cr the Z eight C nine insanely good but the for video most people don't think nikon i had a d90 which was 720 maybe six stops of dynamic range and jello like that you know right. that jello effect was another thing we had to be careful about i yeah. kind of about when you when you pan back and forth um i would say uh i if i remember correctly it was really just that the hdmi port allowed for us to see full hd oh yeah that was the reason. Yeah. So you could actually monitor it correctly. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's Other than point. that, I think they were pretty much neck and neck. Sure. Yeah, and, that's and, fascinating. And when I won that award, I think Nikon didn't really, you know, they didn't really care. Um, they didn't be like, yeah, okay, whatever. They didn't, they didn't see the relevance and they, and it's not their niche, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they didn't set out to get into Hollywood as a production camera. Yeah. Well, and it's funny too, because when they released the D90, they didn't even mention it. It released at 24 P and then they were like, Hey, you can use this for news gathering. And I was like, wait a minute, like five D came out at 30 and they're like, come on, make a film with it. You know, they had what Vincent Lafferette out here, like making a tons of videos and Nikon just went, eh, that's a feature. Have fun. You know? Right. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting how they responded to that. I remember it was like the, they they came to the to the award ceremony. It was kind of like you know shook hands and, and and congratulations and laughed. And I think we did one on their website. We did one interview and they left it at that. And that was it. Well, now they bought red, so they they yeah. figured it out. Now, now they're in. Yeah. But I you know I just realized I just I had forgotten about that. Really? Really? That the, yeah. That's but they bought it. The, yeah, they did it. I think they bought it for like 85 million. Wow. Like it, that, I, that was shocking. I thought it would be in the upper triples, but like right. now, I, now it makes sense why they were kind of like operating on a shoestring or like, you know, just everything that kind of came about that company was they needed to get bailed out. <laughs> wow. I did not realize that. Yeah. They just released that number like uh, maybe like two weeks ago. Um, but I'm excited. I think that that's a good acquisition for both companies. Absolutely. Um, I did want to know, you know, I, I was not a, um, office person. Most people are, I just can't like anything very long. I fall off immediately, you know, but I did want to know, you know, you gaffed what 56 episodes of the office. What's the difference in a show that is ostensibly not lit, you know, quote unquote, not lit. Uh, I was wondering if you could run through maybe similarities and differences between gaffing a show like the office versus house, which similarly quote unquote, not lit, but a little more dramatic looking and, um, you know, like without a trace, which is probably on the further side of that drama. Right. Oh my gosh. You're really reaching back. So, um, all, you know, the whole not lit, but the, obviously they all are, it's more about, um, how they were shot. So, mm -hmm and what the requirements are because of how the execution of the show is done. So the office was uh, two cameras handheld 
a lot of moving around cinema verte obviously you know the new the the documentary crew is always there yeah. and so the lighting requirements had to be such that it allowed for that so really the lighting of like the office set itself was really just all practical it was like fluorescence and, you know, we could control them. We had everything ran to a breaker panel right. so I could turn off any fluorescent at any. It's funny to think about now. I just have to say this because now it'd be like you'd have a stairs in there and you could. Really, oh, my God. You could just like really go to town. But um, which is I'm sure how they'll do it on the reboot. But we did what we had with the tech. We did what we could with the technology at hand. So yeah. basically I could like turn off a fluorescent really quickly if I had to, or a group of them. I also made these, um, I made these weird, uh, uh, contraptions out of foam core that were like a, a triangle white on the inside that, that, and, and then mylar and, and basically you could just, it, how do I describe it? It was basically like a, a like a like a a slanted triangle, okay. and the and the one small part of the triangle was open, and we could put diffusion on that. And basically, you, I could clip that to the fluorescent. Basically, the fluorescent would bounce into that mylar and shoot the light out. Wow, so, that's smart. Yeah, so so that so the so the key grip would we had like like four or five of them. So the key grip could just like, we could put them on one whole row. So if, if uh, um, uh, Steve was walking down, you know, between the desks, you know, all that light that was off camera, not working for us, we could just aim that for, towards him so he didn't have all that top light. That's so smart. So they're basically like little clippable zip lights, essentially. Huh. Or like, yeah. you know, zip modifier. I don't know what you call that. Yeah. It was just this, I, I don't know, came up with that as asked the key grip, like, like, let's try it. Let's see it, see if it works. And we're like, okay, well, we have nothing to lose. And we're like, yeah, this works great. Yeah. So it's kind of a fun thing. And, and we, so I'm getting off topic, but basically. Like I said, that's this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, so ultimately, and I came up with a few other contraptions that were, that um, went on to serve the production well, even at, well after I left from what I understand, but um, but ultimately that, that show had to look like, and, and it was the mantra of the show was it, it's a documentary, so it shouldn't really look any more than it should. Does right. that make sense? Like it shouldn't look great. It shouldn't like, you know, it should just look like it should look. And yeah. so ostensibly I've always felt like if I was making something look too good, then we were getting out of the realm of what the show was. Yeah. So there were times when I know we would purposely, like if we were on a location, like in the in a townhome or something, we'd we'd push the the practicals to be a little brighter than I would if I was doing a you know like a one hour drama mm. or or another or even a half hour narrative. Like if I was doing something where it was just more controlled, I would bring those down into a realm that looked more controlled. But part of that is when the door opens and the camera goes in, it's like it would just be whatever it is. So if you made them just a little brighter than they should be, then it kind of sold that. Yeah. yeah so that's yeah. how that's how that was and compared to like a show like House or or Without a Trace, which was clearly, you know, needed to be dramatized and and the lighting needed to help. It needed to be part of that storytelling. Yeah. So yes, well, of course we had sets and had to make the sets look like we, like the hospital, a real place, or the bullpen for without a trace, a real place. But you know, how can we also make it dramatic looking? Yeah, because like I always think of shows like I was just talking to um, DP of oh no, no no, well in any case I was I was talking to someone about CSI how there's like no that's on the extreme end where it's like there is no way. A, a an investigative body would be like, yeah, let's just do this with the lights off, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so let me just right. like, I need to look inside the uh, the microscope, turn off everything, and put some blinkies in the background. I need more blinkies. Right, <laughs> right. and and highly stylized. That's yeah. that's what that's what those shows are. You know, you're like they're like putting uh, objects in the foreground to dolly through. You yeah. know, whether uh, glass bits that refract light and that just look really cool going through or you know, the old trick C stand arms and you yeah. just 
seeing a light on them and you just go through them. You can't tell what it is. It just looks like, you know, it just looks like, you know, eye candy that you're going through. Yeah. So those, those kinds of things, they, it, you know, it, every show has its needs. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the big difference between a show like the office and, and where it had that definite cameras, cameras had to have the ability to move around with the actors, wherever, whatever we were doing. We rarely put lights on the floor on stands. And did that make your job easier or harder? Um, neither. I mean, you know, it, it, it just comes with the territory, you know, it's like, you're, you know, as a gaffer, I, you know, I did a lot of shows where this was back in the day where you used green beds and had a lot of lights ringing the set. Yeah. That wasn't uncommon. And, um, and so I suppose the office, it wasn't like it really was just a like, OK, how do we how do we take this on? It wasn't really a question of harder or not. It was just a different way of doing it. And the key grip came up. He had these great he came up with this whole like he had NDs and bobinet with magnets. And then, you know, we could like if if one of the actors was we had to have a fluorescent light on for whatever reason or we could just harness it. We could always like make it less where they were or less like if it was offensive on somebody's head or something in the background, but we weren't seeing it on camera. Yeah. We wanted light back there. We could just very quickly just slap something up and, and, and control it that way. The magnet. So we had a lot of our sleep. Yeah. I was going to say that like just those two little tricks alone are, are, I could see anyone using that in a, 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 an actual, you know, like I get sent to do corporate testimonials a lot. And I might steal both because I, you know, obviously the, the false ceiling gives you the little, um, metal things where you could attach the magnets or like oftentimes I'll use a little scissor. Mm-hmm. scissor. Yeah. A little Peggy. Um, but yeah, just having a magnetic ND that you can go like, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Th- those were truly good. And then I think the last, the, one of the other things I came up with partway through is we used a lot of, oh my God, the Kino flows, um, they were the the little rectangular, not not like just the tube ones. They were the, oh my gosh, this is just so bad. The um the Dita lights, not Dita lights. Go go back a little more. The celebs, celebs, yeah, celebs. And so we started using celebs to like key certain spots, mm-hmm. and we didn't, but we wanted to leave the room for the DP and the camera operators to be able to like not, we didn't want them hanging down. So I made these, uh, I went to Home Depot on a weekend one day and I bought a bunch of PVC pipe and I built these telescoping contraptions that were basically like a U and then with feet and I filled the feet with sand yeah. and and basically, you know, you just have a collapse and then, and then lift the ceiling tile, put it up, expand it, lock it, hang the light on it and, you know, safety it to something up in there and you're off to the races. It took like a minute and a half to put up. That's so smart. Yeah. That I, I feel like a lot of, uh, DPs who spend a lot of time gaffing probably have the most efficient ideas for to any given setup, you know, otherwise as if you go, I feel like if you go straight DP your whole, you know, career, you think like, oh, I need a 12 by over here and put as much light inside. Well, what if I just put that up, you know? Right. Just make, right. A, well, you make know, a pipe. I think, I think there's also the, I think it's twofold. Uh, they fortunately got to work with a lot of wonderful DPs and mm. when I was gaffing. So the good part is that you also are absorbing and learning a lot from DPs who know how to light and that are good. And you walk away your bag. of I call it my bag of tricks. You know, your so, case of tricks. Yeah. So they just keep expanding and uh, there's that. And then you create your own because as like you say, as a gaffer, it's like, you know, trying to find ways to be creative, whether it's out of efficiency or out of just like pure necessity or, you know, hey, I just want to try something new and different. You know, any any one of those things or all of them, you know, you you begin to uh, experiment and then you go, OK, this worked this didn't work and you just find those things and, and add on to your repertoire. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any, uh, DPs who kind of, um, 
you could consider like a, a, a mentorship role that helped you out when you were kind of transitioning? Sure. Absolutely. Like David Stockton would be one of phenomenal. And I, I did a lot of work with Eagle Eagleson. I don't know if you know Eagle. No, but that's a great name. <laughs> yeah. He's from Iceland. <laughs> yeah. He directs now. He's not, not shooting anymore from what I, you know, it, what we keep in touch, but I don't think he's, I think he's just directing. Yeah. So super talented, you know, people like that. Um, quite a few of John Peters was a guy I worked with a lot back in my younger gaffing days. Um, he was originally from England, really talented uh, person who, what I loved about working with John is he challenged us all the time. Mm -hmm. And he always enjoyed like, let's not try to light the set the same way every time. Mm. It was fun because it's like, oh, okay. You know, it keeps you on your toes because, you know, on a TV series, it's really easy to fall into that. Right. But it, when you work with somebody, it's like, let's, let's try it like this, this time. Yeah. And like, oh, okay. That sounds like, let's, that would be really fun. And so I think things like opportunities like that really help you expand as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I did. I, I had um, seen when you were talking about uh, in the dark with someone that you kind of habitually have a polarizer in front of the lens, at least for that show. <clears throat> yeah, on on a lot of shows, I'll do this um, with just like a one stop. If it's a a productive one stop polarizer, mm -hmm. some, sometimes you buy when you get them, they're just like you can spin them and spin them and spin them. And they they if it's just depending on the manufacturer, right? You, leak anything out of it but i i do often do that or i don't necessarily keep it on for every shot but if i go into coverage and and um there's a shine on an actor's face i can spin it and usually get the shine out yeah out, and then add your diffusion and it it's helpful so it that's mostly what it's for certainly sometimes there's refl unwanted reflections on other things yeah, that distracting, and and we use them for that. And now you could probably, uh, you know, I haven't really um, tried it, but I could probably just use a two stop um, and and not really ever worry about it now with the way cameras are. Yeah, just in terms of the sensitivity. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was talking to my friend Johnny Durango, another DP, and he had mentioned he does the same thing. He's just like always on polarizer, and I don't know why, but the the handful of times I I must have just potentially been using a shitty one but like i felt like it affected the image too much granted i don't know what the stop rating was um but he's like yeah you just kill it's for killing shine on actors and i was like that's so smart and i don't know why i only thought of it as using it for reflections and always thought that the um skin of people like i always thought it looked too matte mm -hmm. for my taste but uh, are you saying that you could how do you, how do you light for that potentially? Cause obviously it'll, it'll, the contrast ratio might change by spinning that thing around. I, you know, I don't really ever feel like the contrast ratio changes. Mm. I just the, mean like the highlight, you know, if you kill that highlight. It, yes. If you, yes, but it, usually it's an unwanted highlight. So then it's obvious. Okay. Yeah. 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 So then, so then clearly, you know, you're uh, trying to light. It, it really depends on what it's for. And, mm. And so like if I'm lighting something dramatic and and somebody has like say a, a shine here that's I can't seem to get rid of, but I still like the half light, but this is maybe coming from something in some other place or they're picking or something up on under their um eye. Right. I can spin and get it, but it'll still, you know, you can still you're right, maybe you have to push the key light a little bit stronger. Right. If if it takes too much away, but I I find I usually don't have that problem. That's rad. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, the only reason I'm I'm uh, pushing you on it is like I got to start. This is one of those little bag of tricks things. I'm like I should probably start doing. <laughs> this is a great yeah, little so idea. I, you know, saves you some time too. Absolutely. Yeah, I love shooting in the dark. That was a really fun show to shoot. Yeah, it's a yeah. It looks. I, I haven't seen it, but when I was looking through like clips and stills and stuff, it looked very very pretty and dark. Thank you. Yeah, it was the yeah the it, the content allowed for that, and the show creator was great about like let's push this more and change the look up a little bit season to season, and you know just when the the story the the story itself just needed that as yeah. the the main character and her friends were going down this rabbit hole, 
So yeah, it was fun. It was great to do. And I did a lot of, uh, because the main character is blind, I did a lot of like wide open, here you go. The, you know, I, I shot on the light Simulix C lenses. So oh, those are good. <laughs> wide open. 1.4 1. 1. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wide open on her and to give like her world is, you know, falling away around her. Right. And then I did a deeper stop for everybody else. And it was subtle, but it was kind of a cool thing. We had, we kind of had like a little rule book of things to do and, and, and rule books, not the wrong thing, a, a, a Bible guide, of guidebook. I, yeah. Guidebook of like, Hey, let's do, let's, these are, when we're into this, let's do this, let's do that. And I did a lot of wide angle close ups as well, which was really interesting. And then I would use the uh, macro lux, you know, which is basically a diopter made okay. by my lights. And I would, so instead of, you know, instead of using a diopter to try to focus on something close, you know, normally how people use diopters, I would use it kind of in the opposite. I would put it on and then focus on Murphy, the main character, and then everything else would go really crazy out of focus. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Like this much depth of field on her. So it was, it was like a, my focus pullers, which eye, Brad, which eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it really kind of made, and I didn't do that all the time, but there was just, there were sequences where that really made sense when she was really in her own head or when she was um, going into a flashback, you know, when in her mind she was going to go into a flashback, we would, we would do, we would do that effect. Yeah. Yeah. And you shot that on Venice. Yeah. Sunny Venice. With the the Simulex. the I saw in reading about that that you rated it for its higher ISO, but then dropped it down. Was that just to save on um, shadow detail? Like you're shooting at 800, but the camera was set to like 2500, or was that a different show? No, that's that show. So 2500 would be the low light level right. ISO, and so so when we were shooting the you know clearly in low light, I I set it for the 2500. But then incrementally, I could bring down. You could you could go down in in this. That would be the. How do I say this? Um, that would be the main setting, and then you could incrementally come down from there to like if you had too much light. I see. But what what I found is that if I went to twenty five hundred. And just use the, I ended up doing this most of the time. It's like, if I ended up just using NDs, mm. that's what seemed to work best. Yeah. Because where, where the Venice, where, where they set the grayscale, when you go into that higher ISO to that, for that low light level, it's just amazing how it opens up. Yeah, sure. Spectacular. So it really, it, it really can lead you to a lot of creative it can open the creative doors even more. I think, I don't know. I, I found it to be really awesome and fun to work with. So I'm trying to remember all the variables because it's been a while since I shot that show. So I'm trying to remember all the things. Sure. Are some... Well, I'm the, yeah, the only reason I wanted to bring it up is because I, you know, a lot of times people with the Alexa will rate it at like 1600 because the grain structure looks kind of quote unquote grain structure looks kind of nice. Um, but I hadn't really heard anyone kind of off speed the Venice, you know, so that was, yeah, it was just like a, yeah, and I think that I found that if you go up from 800, it just doesn't tend to hold up as well. Mm. I mean, it depends. What, I mean, it depends what you're doing. So I'm sure, like, yeah, well, it's the right look, you know. So I don't know. Yeah, on uh, I, I saw just some terrible news about prom dates, which is that you were restricted from using twinkle lights a lot. <laughs> that's that sucks. That sucks, man. <laughs> It was, it was the director, uh, Kim, who's absolutely awesome. I enjoyed every minute of working with her. She, she was the best, but when she first told me that I was like, Oh, okay. And she's like, no, they're just so overused. They're in every damn, you know, adolescent movie. And she's every right. Every party scene. Yeah. Every, every single party scene. And I enjoyed that challenge, but you know, she was open, like clearly like, and, and this was obviously the production designer was really helpful and heavy handed in, in this as well. But like that opening sequence when they're, when they're young and they sneak into the prom yeah. and there's, there was a lot of twinkle lights there. And that was, 
you know, she was fine with that. And then there was um, an overuse of twinkle lights in that, in that, um, house that, part yeah, at the frat house that, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that really cool giant wall of twinkle lights, which yeah. was so awesome. Uh, so I think that, um, but I think overall, I kind of pick up on what she's saying. Like, let's find a different way to do it. Let's find yeah. other things. And so I, I appreciated that and, and enjoyed the challenge, to be honest. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing I really liked about just the way you got, you lit it was it's still like, first of all, it's been a while since it like, a I sub- <laughs> has to say raunchy comedy but you know like they're, they're few and far between these days like you know 2005 you the, every other movie was kind of but the when i think of your kind of will ferrell type comedies they were more lit you know whatever like the office you know they weren't necessarily that whereas this has a very stylized look while still looking very natural and uh were you pretty much like uh just churching up practicals and using that or and just maybe like one led because i know you guys had kind of a slightly more limited budget so like how are you getting that really um ugh, cinematic look with <laughs> um while still keeping everything both affordable and like practical based so i think it was a combination of things i think part of it's the look that kim was wanting to achieve with keeping it grounded mm. and being it feel feel grounded and 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 not over the top in any in any real way and the production designer and her created a great lookbook uh, that was a, a wonderful guide to go off of. So, you know, like colors and and just kind of the vibe of the whole film and where we were going, what we were going for. Um, that's the base. And then from there, I would say, yes, we did a lot of practicals. And uh, Julie Dreck, our production designer, I mean, our um, set decorator uh, was so wonderful because we would talk practicals and they would always make and we would say, can we put one here? Can we put one and we had to draw them out on the on the set plans and she would have more than that. So I could always take stuff away. But the idea being that, yes, let's largely let practicals drive the light and then you know, augment as needed and then of course completely clean it up in coverage yeah. so that's basically that's basically what we did and i also think it's the the we use the sigma cine primes those are nice and they did a beautiful job i was so pleased with with those lenses they um i just felt like they had a really nice look i felt the contrast was nice i thought the skin tones and colors looked really uh bang on and they just had a really good vibe to them that was really pleasing and i think the first time like at the first i feel like it was maybe the first week we were shooting it was all kind of starting to become a blur now but we were in jess's room where she's at the computer looking at the um she's watching a blog on on makeup mm. and i just remember we had the camera behind the, the computer and the practicals and everything and i went back to the monitor and i was like oh wow this looks really, this looks really nice. This has a really good vibe to it. You know, I, I, at that moment really appreciated those lenses. So I think it was kind of a combination of it all, but yes, I would, we used a lot of, um, Astera Titans and Helios. I mean, it was all the entire show was location except for the stripper room. Right. And so, so ultimately it was like putting in Astera's where we could and, softening them. I uh, had the gaffer um, put white, uh, basically pool noodles. The on pool them. neuters are really popular right now. I've seen them everywhere. Yeah. So that worked, that worked great. And um, yeah, we did, we just did a lot of that kind of work. So figure out where the lighting could go and then uh, where the, where the practicals can go and, the, and go from, from there to, um, to, to augment the light and and clearly there was there was like the frat house we very much wanted a particular look in there yeah. i used a lot of stars in there out of frame rigged up on the in the hallways and in various places and so that was a lot of fun yeah that a lot of fun so you were you primarily using the tubes to augment your practicals or did you have like uh, light mats or anything that were kind of also coming in 
I had both. I had some um, uh, light gear mats. Yeah. I had some Kinos. Some I, I maybe celebs. The LED Kinos. No, I think we. I me, oh, me, fluorescents. What? God, I'm so embarrassed. This is terrible that I can't remember all my. All I my mean, life. this was what you filmed this like a year ago. You're not supposed year to remember yeah. everything. So, so Matt Nardone, my gaffer, um, his East Coast based. Uh, is an aficionado when it comes to all this LED technology. And so I relied heavily on him with like, I would say, here's what I want. Here's the outcome of what I want. And you would say, here's what I think we should do. And um, I, I always, and I do use the sky panels. So we had a set of sky panels that we were using off camera when, you know, anytime we went into close-ups, I would, I would, you know, bring in a four by diffusion with an A crate and, 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 you know, I'd either run something through magic cloth or some heavy diffusion. I also like shower curtain. Yeah. Um, I love how that actually puts a sheen on the face and in a, in a, it makes skin look healthy. So yeah, I love that. Or I'll, I'll double it up. I'll, you know, have one, the diffusion and, um, and then I'll, I'll do a, I'll just do a wag flag of, of shower curtain, you know, just out of frame. And so that kind of stuff, that's what we did a lot of. I've, uh, I've literally started using just for speed's sake. Uh, like I said, like doing these corporate interviews, I tend to do a lot of recently, uh, is just bringing the, uh, I have a vortex four and mm -hmm. then I'll just T bar literal shower curtain. And, and the guy that I work with every time, like l the first time I did, he goes, what the, what is that? And I was like, just trust me, just trust me. It'll look good. <laughs> Ignore the shower curtain and the cheap pole it's on that I got from Amazon. It'll look good. <laughs> I think Roscoe makes what they call shower curtain and, and, um, you can buy it, you can buy a roll of it and then you can make your own wag flags with it or frames or whatever. That's cool. I, I, I grew up old school, so I call it shower curtain cause that's what all the old timers called it. So gotcha. Were you using the, uh, the Sigma classics or the, or the regulars? I used the, for the majority of the show, it was the Cine, the regular Cine primes and then for the beginning we used the classics the flashbacks when they're young was all classics gotcha yeah now those look really pretty but they can be flary <laughs> yeah oh i loved it i i loved the way they looked i i wish more of it was in the movie right sure. what uh let's see here talk about that Oh, what uh, what made you go with the Sigmas as opposed to like sticking with the uh, the Leicas? Because um, you know the the Sigma the Cine Primes are fairly neutral, um, as are the Leicas. You know, so was it just like a budget thing? Because they look, in my opinion, they look relatively close. They do, and it was somewhat budget. Terrible. It was a it was somewhat a budget thing. I certainly was interested in trying them, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was a good opportunity to to play with them and, and give it a go and see how I liked them. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, I love those things. Um, I did want to know about, uh, your pre-production process. Cause, cause you had how many weeks to, for pre-production on this? Three. <laughs> so, uh, what, what were you doing? Sorry, try not to sneeze. What were you doing to, um, kind of stay efficient in that process and, and make sure you got everything you needed? Every damn you? thing we could. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, to answer your question, the week, so the week, so we had three weeks of prep in Syracuse, New York week before, um, Kim and I, Kim asked me if I'd be willing to jump on some zooms or FaceTime, whatever, whatever they used and look at locations. So basically they would be the production designer and the location manager and the line producer and a couple other people, they would go to a location and they'd have the phone and, and Kim and I were still here in LA. So we'd, we'd be looking at it and, and it's like, Hey, hold that. And they, you know, we'd walk through the set with them and be like, this works, this doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. So we were able the week before to eliminate I, I think three or four locations that were just would have been a waste of time for us to go see while we were one, once we're boots on the ground in Syracuse. So that was really helpful. The other thing I did was uh, Kim and I had a lot of discussions and going over the, the lookbook and just talk, you know, having, getting ourselves to the point that by the time we got to Syracuse 
and and we hit it day one going to look at locations and work we could we could really just start diving in and talking about blocking and that kind of thing so basically how it worked is is we would pick our location and maybe see two or three locations in a day whatever we had to do and then kim and i would go back and we would with through artemis we we would we would stand there and block it all out and take notes and then go back to the office and I transfer everything over to, I use shot designer for just overheads. Mm-hmm. So I would just basically create, I would just input, I just would import the, whatever the plan was of whatever set we were doing. And I would, I would basically create my setups until I had what I wanted, like setup one, setup two, setup three. And then we could, and then that would list you know, our shots. And then I could decide if, if we were going to, if we were going to overdo it and we couldn't like, it would be impossible to make our day. Right. So, you know, I, and then her and I could sit down and go, okay, well, maybe we could get away with this shot turning into this instead. And we would just like work together, collaborate to get our shot list to a reasonable point. And then I could also attach photos from Artemis onto that. And I also had him on, uh, on a Google drive. And then I, like the gaffer and the key group, everybody could access all that. Right. And the first AD, I would send him everything like, you know, like the day before we were shooting, I would send him a final shot list for the, whatever it is we were shooting the next day and they would distribute that. So basically we, that's how we spent our prep. And I know Kim was stretched. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds easy for me, but I know Kim was stretched as the director in a thousand different directions. I mean, she was dealing with, um, you know, choreographing the banana dance and, and, you know, making a million different decisions and props and wardrobe and this, that, and the other. And so I tried as much as I could to help in any way I could, but there are just things that, you know, the director has to decide on, but I tried to take as much responsibility for the, the, the blocking and, and helping with shot efficiency and working with the first AD on that as well, we had a really good rapport, and and so that by the time we started shooting, we really knew what we were we were doing. All, all clearly with the gaffer and the key grip, so we we did we did pretty damn good, I thought. Yeah, <laughs> just three weeks, 20, twenty days of shooting. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's see, that's efficient. That's a that's getting it out of there. That's fun. Um, talked about practicals. Talked about that. Trying to get through my notes before I got to let you go. Um, yeah, you talked about the tools. What else? Are, what else? Are you? Oh, you know what? I could talk about because I never. I was usually I ask this at the beginning, but this might be a fun way to wrap it up. Uh, uh, have you been watching anything uh, that you enjoyed recently? Oh my gosh! Let's see. We've been watching Outer Range. That's a good one. We just revisit, well, an older show that we just finished up was The Americans. I and see. I watched like the first few episodes of that and I was like, this is like when it came out and I was like, this is cool. And then never got back to it. But that's like been on my list for a while because I know that really hits. Um, we've been watching, uh, let me see, what are the other ones? Palm Royale. Sure. Um, <laughs> we, we just finished that. Yeah, we watched, we seem to watch a lot of shows. We just oh. started season two of Outer Range, but you know, because we because we had finished season one recently, so we're like, let's get let's get on that. Um, yeah, uh, gosh, you say this, and I, I'm like, what other shows have we watched? My wife would be like, come on, we watch this, this, this. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny because you know, a lot of times I'll ask DPs, like, you know, if they're watching anything, and. Uh, especially if they're on a job or about to, they're like, I can't, I can't look at one more screen. So the fact that you shoot TV and also are like, no, nope, uh, I'm going to continue watching shows is like uh, commendable because that's, well, you know, yeah. that's, that's an investment in, in time. It is an investment in time, but you know, I like good. There's so much good television yeah. there and I just love seeing everybody's work. And um, I, I just appreciate we all know what it takes to get through a day and we all know what it takes to do all this. And so when I watch shows and I, and I see what they're doing, um, it's really fun for me. 
because I get to enjoy, I get to enjoy it on a, on a different level. Yeah. And so, yeah, I take away a lot from watching the shows and, and I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm feel like I'm, I'm try to be a filmmaker. Yeah. If, not just a cinematographer, but try to approach things as a filmmaker, not in, and try to have a wider um, view of things. Yeah. Well, you just directed a short, didn't you? I did. It'll be in Cine, it'll, uh, tomorrow I'll be screening at Cine Gear. Oh, no shit. Okay. It'll be the finals competition. So uh, the, all the screenings of everything is like 1130 to 330. And then I think they said the short films are two to 330. And I don't know where in that block, ours is a 20 minute film. So I don't know where in that block ours falls, but it'll be, it'll be screening tomorrow. Okay, cool. I'll uh, definitely try to, again, my, my coverage is pretty loosey goosey, so I can probably cut away for 20 minutes and not find you guys. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'll be mostly at that theater tomorrow. I I don't know how much I'm going to get out Saturday. I'm going to really hit it hard. Yeah. I feel like that's most people's plan. Friday is like, oh, hey, oh, hey. And then Saturday, yeah. everyone just pretty much parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks a lot for uh, spending the time with me, man. I really appreciate it. And, and uh doesn't always happen that I learned quite a bit, but I actually learned quite a bit instead of just a bit. <laughs> I feel so honored. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, like- Thank you so much for having me. And um, I'll look forward to meeting you in person and maybe we can hit the castle together. Yeah, absolutely. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, you can do so on Patreon by going to frameandrefpod.com, where you can get all the episodes and clicking the Patreon button. It's always appreciated, and as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.